when, when we're done, we have things to talk about. <laughs> because I was involved in starting uh, native language television in Canada. And I firmly believe that native people are well able to speak for themselves. And in many ways, I can't believe that I am in this position now because for, for years I thought, I have nothing to say about this. And, um, and I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for a journalistic colleague who dared me to make a radio program about native people with no stereotypes in it. And that's when I met, met Irving Hallowell. And so, um, uh, so I, I, I have now, I, I was a journalist for 35 years, and I saw the light, studied anthropology at Oxford, and I have been a curator for exactly three years. Long enough to learn that I, I think we probably all accept. There were a few myths that we were talking about, and one of them is the myth of the deliberate collection. <laughs> I know perfectly well my collection is probably quite typical of yours, but it just came together willy-nilly. And um, people intended certain things that didn't happen. Other things happened that nobody intended. We have a collection in our museum which started in 1970, which is 120 years older than our museum. Uh, things were collected before our museum was imagined. Uh, the other thing is um, that I'd just like to raise, and I'll get back to it, is the myth that humans are the only actors here. And um, I'm very glad that Nicholas Thomas is here because I am a big, big fan of Alfred Jell. And when I fell upon Alfred Jell in Oxford, I thought, aha, finally, I have found somebody I can talk to, talk about with my Ojibwe colleagues. Because Alfred Jell posits a world in which objects do things. And this is not a form of magical thinking by Native people. We would not have museums if we didn't think that objects speak across time and culture. The whole point of museums is that objects have tremendous social power. And, uh, and uh, so I want to, I'll, I'll go back to that, but it's, it's, it's really f the foundation of what I have to say today. Uh, the pictures that you see here are kind of a, a summary of what's about to come, because I think that um, the whole project of co-collecting or whatever you call it is around the establishment of relationships. And relationships, you sometimes fall into them, you sometimes um, they are, you're confronted by them, uh, and, uh, but it is all relationships. And, um, and to start with, I'd just like to point out that, well, in, in museum practice in Manitoba, there is simply no way to avoid uh, working with First Nations people, not that I would ever want to, but um, I co-authored co um, this paper with my colleague Roger Roulette and um, could not have happened without him. He's a linguist and a guide to the arcane world of the Ojibwe. And um, he, um, he would have been here if we could, could have organized it, but, but his um, contribution is the Ojibwe words and my understanding of Ojibwe thinking, especially as regards the role of objects in people's lives. So um, this, this word that we have for the, the uh, title of the paper, which is, and I'll just, if Roger was only here, but anyway, not <laughs> It means families created by images. And if any of you happen to know anything about the Algonquian languages, Anishinaabe is one of the largest of this group of languages, you will know that the genius of the Anishinaabe language is that because of its agglutinative structure, there is no end to the words that can be invented. So you'd never ask an Ojibwe person, is there a word for that? They will just make it up on the spot. But is it an old word? Is it an old idea? In this case, this is a, a perhaps, like, it's not a new word. It's an old idea being reapplied. And um, the word mazanate, is uh, the word uh, for images, and it would, in its original sense, have applied to um, the, the figures that are on birch bark scrolls. And the Ojibwe alone, I think, among Native Americans, have always had a written aspect to their culture. They are able to pass on songs and stories and ceremonial instructions via birch bark scrolls. And when syllabic writing came along, they just took to it like that. Um, and uh, have been literate for 150 years, no thanks to any school system. So they, um, they have a real understanding of the power of word images, and photographs falls into that same category. And um, 
uh, the, the, so the, the, these, this idea that images can create a family is also important because the Medeoan scrolls, the scrolls that were the texts for ceremony, uh, the, the Medeoan as a celebration requires the participation of every clan so that in a, within a community there would be members of all the different ones. And if, if they don't have every clan, people are asked to stand in for another clan so that the family as a ceremonial group will be complete. So I think it's quite an appropriate thing. The family that I'm referring to is the family of this man here. This is Namimwan. He was a very powerful medicine man and the leader of the Medeoan in his community. And he was one of the principal informants of an American anthropologist named A. Irving Hallowell. Hallowell was a professor of anthropology at uh, Penn's, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he was a member of the American Philosophical Society and uh, he was a former pre uh, president of the American Anthropological Association. So he, he became reasonably famous over the years and um, had a lot of impact on his students, um, uh, one of whom was my friend, and that's how I found out about Halawa. And um, uh, so when I was dared to make the radio show with no stereotypes in it, I was working with this friend and um, uh, Oh, this is more of Halawal's, uh, sorry, Namuwan's family. This is the Medeoan group in the community of Pangasi. I'll just uh, maybe show you where I'm talking about. There's Halawal. Uh, Pangasi is the community that I did my field work in, and um, my name in Pangasi is the Halawal woman because I'm the next anthropologist. He was there 65 years before me, and nobody else went back. So uh, his name is in Ojibwe, Medewigama, so I'm Medewigama Wikwe, so I'm the, the Halawal woman. Halawal is the curly haired guy on the right, and on the left is his informant, uh, his guide, his collaborator, and his friend, William Behrens. This is the photograph I was looking at that got me going on the radio show. I thought, well, hey, wouldn't it be great to do a radio show where we see if we can't find that drum that was made. That photograph was taken in 1932. I wonder if the drum still exists. And um, so I followed from the APS library all the way to northern Canada and found the drum in a museum. And then I just, that was first hour, and then hour two, I just kept going up the river and following the stories and figuring out that there were two drums and then figuring out that, uh, that the guy who made it was in the next community over and finally I got to Pangasi and the grandson of Namuan who made this drum and who invented this ceremony and he uh, had, he, then I, I was found out an amazing amount, they sang me the songs and um, they still remembered the story and the dream. So, um, so I got my start with Pangasi. Hallowell as well got his start with the stories of the people on the Barrens River. And for any of you who came across Hallowell in uh, Tim Ingold's book on perception, he has a little bit where he talks about the conversation Hallowell has with the guy about stones. There's the stones. Um, the guy he actually had the conversation with is the fellow on the right there who is um, named John Duck. And, um, uh, it's totally fascinating, but stones are animate. And those stones are particularly animate, as, as John Duck pointed out. Stones are grammatically animate, which makes them potential actors. It sort of sets the stage for their animacy. Not all stones can do things, but the point is some can. And those stones would be stones that would be seen to be doing something because there's little gifts all around the bottom there um, from people who hope that they will guide them. This is the view of Pangasi, as Hallowell would have seen it, in uh, 1933. This is how I got there. Nice old plane. It's older than I am. <laughs> but it works perfectly well. So, see, it, land, it, it takes off on those little wheels from the runway, and then it lands on the water when we get to Pangasi. And it is just achingly beautiful country. Uh, there's a map. Um, and uh, you can see that it's just north of Winnipeg. It's not as far north as you can get, but it is probably as remote as you can get. Um, the communities of this area have the highest language retention of any um, Ojibwe-speaking community in, in North America. And uh, it's like the, uh, the language retention is around 97%. Um, uh, people speak 
beautiful Ojibwe. They speak what my friend Roger calls Shakespearean Ojibwe. And um, Pangasi is not a place that's never been visited. This is a map from the 1700s um, that shows the three sort of main highways into the fur trade. And the one on the far right goes right past Pangasi. That's why it's there. It's uh, on a, um, and, and it, this is interesting too, just keep this one in mind. This, this shows um, Ojibwe mapping methods. If you're on a river, all you need to know is stay on the river till you come to a lake, then don't fall off the river, you know. So, so this map is, is drawn by a Frenchman, in fact, but it really shows how uh, a native person would, would tell a person how to get there. This is uh, Pangasi now. I was just there two weeks ago. No, a month ago. I was there for the World Heritage Site thing. And the people there are nice people. I have had really, really good times with the kids. And uh, th this was interesting. This was uh, a kids, and uh, they were ma being made to wait for something. There was some official opening happening. And the kids just sat down and played old hand games that no, no teacher taught them. It's how they passed the time. And this is one of the men who sang me one of the songs from the drum. Ah, so here's Hallowell again, sitting in front of his tent in uh, Pangasi. And um, the f photographs that Hallowell left behind uh, show the easy relationship he had with people. So he, he did his field work over 10 years. He went up the river seven summers of those 10 years. Uh, the people knew him well. And uh, the pictures show very little reserve. They're, they're uh, people who uh, you know, are happy to be photographed. He did photos of families and he did some when early on when the kids are small and then later the kids are bigger. Um, and uh, he was allowed to photograph ceremonial structures and so on. There's no pictures of ceremonies happening except one little dance, which was a social dance. But um, there's th these are wonderful photographs. Um, and um, they're now in the vault at the American Philosophical Society. The American Philosophical Society is a, is a, has a library like no other. It's when you sit there and you read, you're surrounded by the books of Benjamin Franklin. And Thomas Jefferson ran it for 25 years. So it's just like, it's a sort of American icon as a library. It uh, looks lovely. That's actually not as old as it looks, but when they needed new space, rather than ruin the aesthetics, they just went down five floors. And um, uh, so over the last six years, I have worked with this photographic collection and with these very nice people in Philadelphia. And um, so this is a picture that shows, um, the guy on the left is the director of their new Native American Research Center. The next woman is Sophia Rabliaskas, who is part of a World Heritage Site bid. Uh, to, they would like to turn the area, which includes Pangasi, I think it's four million hectares of boreal forest, crossing two provinces, to, into a World Heritage Site. And so the, the, the APS has been very helpful in this regard. Then there's me, and then that's Roger, who I uh, mentioned before. Roger and I went, and we we're all, this picture was taken in Philadelphia, because we all went down to speak. And um, one of my happier moments was watching Roger talk to a double Nobel Prize winner and, and would not be the least bit flummoxed. He's a pretty smart guy himself. So uh, this is the Pangasi tribal lands. You can see the reserve is tiny. But in this part of the world, um, there's no mine, there's no dam, there's no forestry, there's no, there's a winter road. Uh, but but it's vir virtually untouched from when people signed the treaty. So these people signed the treaty in 1875. They were promised the right to hunt and trap on their tribal lands and make a living, which they did for 130 years until Europeans stopped wanting to buy wild fur. And it was the economics of the collapse of the fur trade, which really uh, limited their economic possibilities. But they have lived there and been economically successful for uh, as long as the fur trade, 250 years. So the uh, project with the, the Philosophical Society is um, a really interesting one. Now, the wonderful thing about a, a library that was founded by Benjamin Franklin is that it's extremely well healed. So they applied for a million dollar grant 
the Mellon Foundation, um, the total project was to digitize 3,000 hours of native language material. They have the largest collection of native language spoken material of any library in the States. And 500 of those hours were Ojibwe people from Pungasi speaking. And uh, so uh, it would have taken me the rest of my life to do that. And um, they also digitized all the Hallowell photos. And so the, the digital aspect of this project initially was, okay, let's get it, get it digital. Let's just get it so that we can do something with it. Let's make it accessible. And um, so uh, this is the American Philosophical Society uh, website. You go on it, you, uh, you make an inquiry. Uh, you ask for the Irving Hallowell papers, as I would do, and then you see that, see that one that's highlighted, Series A? That's the Barron's uh, collection. That's all of these communities, the photos I've been showing you. And um, there was a time when, if you wanted to look it up by the person in the photo, you looked up Hallowell, you got all 900 of all these other photos you took as well. And um, if you were interested in this picture or in these people, there was no way of knowing anything about it. And immediately the limits of simple digitization became available, and, uh, became apparent. And the, um, and, and the very first thing that anybody said in the community was, well, you know, can we tell you who those people are? I, I had some idea already. And so I went to the community with Xerox copies of these pictures. People wrote on them who was who. And, uh, and I've been going to the APS uh, at least once a year. I uh, started with uh, one month and then uh, since then a week or two every year to add names to the, the database. So that, and, and the APS said, sure, fine, okay. And what they allowed me to do was to add searchable categories. So now uh, you go to the Irving Hallowell papers and this is the record for that photograph you just saw. And everybody who's in the picture is named. See, oh, see all this bit? That was empty before, and now all those people are there. And, um, and then this is the way you can search, and uh, you can search by personal name or by subject, and I was able to add both of those categories. And I would work away all day, and I would f check the spelling to the best of my ability, and usually a linguist friend came with me, and we kind of got it right. And then, overnight, this whole thing would just b go do whatever it does. Next morning, they could read it in Pangasi. And they could say, well, you know, that's, that, you know, that guy's name's wrong, you know, this one. And so that I was able to do this, thank you to the, the, this digital tool, um, in Philly and get it uh, edited as we went along. So here's, here's the old Hallowell searching thing. And you can see now how few of the, uh, the records that are the subjects are actually anything to do with Hallowell and how many of them are all these other things. And if you look up Owen, which is the principal last name in Pangasi, you see all these Owens. And uh, that, that was just simply not possible before. And so now kids in the community can look up their great-grandparents and find them. And um, so, I mean, you, anybody who's done this knows this is a lot of work. And, um, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that the APS has made it so possible. But, so now there's, this is, a, this is one of the pivotal pictures. This picture is of the young people, the apprentices, uh, that were training when Hallowell was there. And I interviewed seven of those people because they were still alive when I went to Pangasi. And I had this picture. And I interviewed this chap here, Charlie George Owen, Omshush. And uh, there he is. That's him when I talked to him. And the woman beside him was the person who helped me out with translation because Charlie George spoke not a word of English. He was in a hospital for five months and never learned the word for toilet. He just couldn't take it and do it at all. So Margaret helped me. And Margaret is the granddaughter of Willie Barron. So there we were, the granddaughter of, uh, of Willie Barron's, the grandson of Namuwan. And I'm like the academic grandchild of Hallowell. It was a happy moment. And here they are looking at that exact picture. Uh, you can see the, the mic... I recorded all these conversations for the radio show, and so um, you can see that he's wearing a microphone, but he's looking at Hallowell's photo and saying who's in the picture and what's happening, and remembering his youth. So there he is again. He's the second on the left in that picture. There. So that's Charlie George, and um, you see the things he's wearing in that picture. 
Um, he's wearing a bandolier. Uh, it was actually signified that he was standing in for the Bear Clan, which they didn't have any of in Pangasi. And um, one of the reasons he and Roger got along so well was Roger is truly Bear Clan. And uh, this is the bandolier. So one of the amazing turn twists of fate in my life is that I now am the curator of this collection. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't belong to my museum. It belongs to uh, another mu uh, institution as in the process of being repatriated to the community. But I have to look after it. And I was able to photograph it. This is Charlie George's bandolier. This is what was underneath his shirt. This is a gorget. Um, and uh, this is his aunt who made it. So uh, one of the tapes I have is Charlie George remembering watching the aunt sew these things. It's an amazingly well-documented collection. And um, uh, here's the cape that she wore in the dance. Her name was Redbird. And you can see Masqua O. That's, how, that's her cape. And this is the symbol that's on that uh, thing. And this symbol is the symbol that was on that great big drum that I showed you before. It's also part of, uh, this is that same photograph. This is Anak, it's, that means star, Marianne Keeper. And I, um, the other side of it, that cape is actually the one that's showing in that picture. But. And so this is the, the ceremonial pavilion that Hallowell observed and that, um, uh, though this is, uh, shows that the, the, this is the only picture of that drum that shows that pattern. And this is the, that big drum. And um, so the, the drumstick is in this collection that I'm talking about. And the, uh, the big drum is in a different museum, but nearby. You can see that, that, that theme. That, that is not a Maltese cross. That's a, a Ojibwe symbol for the morning star. Uh, it's the star that visits you. There's lots of stories of girls marrying stars. That's the one. And so, um, so back to the, the Hallowell uh, stuff. One of the people in that picture was a fellow called Jacob Owen. His name is S, which is clam in Ojibwe. There he is when I knew him. And um, so when we were looking at that picture, when Charlie George was looking at that, um, one of the things about drums and about this drum in particular was that uh, People did amazing things with those drums. And the drums themselves were amazing. And uh, so I said, well, Charlie, how does that work? He said, well, if you want to know, you have to ask the guy with the feather, because he's the one who knows about thunder. And the idea is that thunderbirds give you a drum. And um, so Jacob is a person who had a practice in um, Ojibwe healing. This is his sucking tube for if you're attacked, somebody might blow something into you, it just gets it out. And um, Jacob carried on this practice while being a Mennonite lay preacher, because it never even occurred to him there was a conflict. He was a wonderful guy, a really wonderful guy. Um, and um, so this is a, another family. Uh, so if you look up Jacob Owen, S, now in the Hallowell collection, you find that there's more than one picture of him. There's that ceremonial picture. And then here he is with his wife and children. He, he loved his wife. and. Uh, uh, when I used to go visit him, uh, little birds would sit on the window ledge of his house. And I once asked him, I said, that's unusual behavior for a bird. And he said, oh, that's my wife. She visits me every day. And um, she, was, uh, she was a wonderful person, too. So there's young Jacob. And there's old Jacob. So when, Jacob, when, so when I finally got around to asking Jacob about thunder, he said, well, you know, uh, and he prayed for me for an hour, really. Uh, there's an hour of tape, Jesus this, Jesus that. And then finally, you know, because he, he, I don't know, concerned. And then finally he turned to Margaret, who was translating, and, and he said something like, oh, well, what does she want me to talk about? And Margaret said, do you know thunder? And he said, yes. And then he, I have another two hours of him talking about thunderbirds. And the key part of the story, he told really one of the most amazing uh, stories because people rarely tell you about how they met a spirit entity but he told the story of how he went to this river and um, he was called across the river by a little um, a little person a meme -gwesiwa. and um, in order to cross the river the the water stopped and he walked and he got onto the island and the Memegwesi introduced him to a thunderbird. The thunderbird landed 
and um, Jacob was terribly frightened and uh, didn't know what to do. And gradually, the Thunderbird taught him how to show respect, how to smoke for him. And it was, it's like a comedy. He's, he said the Thunderbird told him to get out his pipe and smoke. And he patted his, he said, I don't have a pipe. And then he patted his pocket. Oh, there is a pipe there. And um, anyway, it just goes on and on with him finding the thing he needs and stumbling. And, and, he, and the Thunderbird says, well, don't you know my name? And the guy says, and Jacob says, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> and then the bird says, well, my name is Waksha Ganeshi. And Waksha Ganeshi is the, it's not just Thunderbirds generally. This is a named Thunderbird that looks after Pangasi. This is the Thunderbird that visited their community uh, regularly. It was an individual Thunderbird. Anyway, so this amazing story carries on. Jacob makes lots of mistakes. The river starts up. He thinks he's going to drown. And then finally he gets it. And um, so this is, uh, story is all obviously recorded. And um, it uh, explains why Fairwind was able to do the things he was, Namuan. This is, uh, so Namuan had two drums. He had a, that big drum, and he had this drum here. This is a water drum. This is a water drum, this big around. Joe, you will know that that's a heck of a big water drum. <laughs> and, and this pavilion that he, they practiced in is 40 feet long. It's just a pavilion for dancing. It's no, not, a, not to live in. And it's the, also the biggest, most fancy, um, it's called the Wabano Wigamic uh, that I have ever seen a record of. And so, so what we have is these pictures, this amazing story, these artifacts, and I just want you to hear a little bit of the audio. Where's my mouse? There we go. Um, so this is Charlie George talking about why they had drums. <laughs> So um, Roger, who I mentioned several times, uh, produces these transcripts of Charlie George. Uh, Roger can type 30 words a minute in syllabics. You can type 90 words a minute in English orthography, and uh, it's a gift uh, that he has, and um, he understands that. Uh, he makes his living as a translator, and he teaches Ojibwe and so on, but um, he and I both love the old man, Charlie George, and Roger has produced a thousand pages of transcripts of the, of the words of these people, Jacob and Charlie George. And so that, too, is added to the uh, APS material. Here's the here's image of the Thunderbird from uh, the Hallowell Collection at the NMAI. And, um, and there's other bird figures in the ceremony thing. And this uh, is an example of Roger's transcripts. I can also play it to you. But it gives you an idea of the wealth of the digital collection at the APS because there's now the audio, there's the pictures, there's the transcript and the translation. And um, uh, this is uh, the scope of the APS. These are all the communities in the States where they have actually distributed um, native language material to support native language speakers, and they have distributed um, our material from Pangasi to four or five um, uh, Anishinaabe-speaking communities in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, so this is that picture of that big drum. And uh, so now uh, the thing is that I think you could say that um, certain kinds of objects lend themselves to digitization. You could say that the, uh, the like the, the pictures, uh, you get a fair equivalent from a digital reproduction of a photograph. You can print it again. Uh, audio, it nowadays, exists only as a digital um, f fact. It, 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 we talk about tape, we talk about clips. No physical thing exists anymore. I used to tape little pieces of tape on the wall and physically Tape, you know, sticky tape them together. Uh, I still edit, but I, I don't use my machine. And so it, they, they exist as digital things. They, they don't suffer from reproduction. You can virtually repatriate them without losing anything. You know, you can even hang on to the copyright um, if, you, if you, well, you dream. But anyway, um, uh, and so uh, the same thing is true of, of Roger's transcripts. They exist as digital things. There's no 
more little notes about how he struggled with how to say this or experimented with what word for that. So um, they lend themselves to a digital environment. And um, uh, objects resist. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a person in the museum, I know the struggle I have with the digital database and how unsatisfactory it is. I, uh, you know, I look up things and the, the, physical, the description of it, I can't tell one thing from the other. Every tea cozy sounds the same and they're all spelled differently. It's just, it, like the sort of digital environment is very difficult for people. And for objects like this one, it's, it's, not, really, uh, it's not really all it is. So um, I, uh, well, in addition to us subscribing to Alfred Jell and his ideas, um, there's a woman named Catherine Hales who's written about uh, sort of postmodernity, and she makes a nice distinction between uh, it's a kind of a sliding scale from materiality to information. So that um, the material thing, like that's right in front of me, uh, that I can touch and smell and feel, has its maximal materiality, um, and the information that I might have on a computer or in a database about where it is on a shelf, you know, it's like the difference between locking eyes with somebody and knowing you could find them on the web if you really had to. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's uh, locational, it's like descriptive, but it's not present. And so people come to museums, it, uh, they want to experience the objects, they, they want that eye lock contact. And um, uh, so in that sense, I think objects really have much more of a personhood. And then in addition to that, uh, pardon me, but this is not complicated, Marilyn Strathern has really usefully explained the complexity of personhood. And what she says is that there's no such thing as a whole person. All we have are relationships. So at this moment, I have a relationship with you. You don't know I can ride a horse. You could care less if I have three grandchildren, although it's very important to me. Um, but, but all you can know is one facet of my personhood. Those other facets are either unknown to you at this point or will never be known to you. Uh, the same thing is true of objects. They have this dividual quality. They, I, you know, I can tell you that Namuan had this drum and and Joe can vouch for the fact that it's, a, it's an outstanding, <laughs> scary drum. And uh, you know, if I told you I had stories about it being used for murder, it's a big deal. But this drum was kidnapped, and you'd never guess that. This drum has friends in Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, it was a, a, a drum which has had a, a, adventures which I have now written about, but honestly, you wouldn't believe it. And, it, and I, in telling the story of what happened to this drum, I did a kind of Alexandria quartet about it. I talked about Charlie George, Omashush, and his point of view on what happened, his way of talking about it, and how he, how he attributed animacy to it. The word he used for this drum is wikan, which is a ritual brother. And uh, in, uh, as, an object as wikan is always grammatically animate to address them as persons. Um, and then uh, I talked about the museum and how they classified things and how they created, you know, shelves with drums on them so that it was compared to other drums. Um, I talked about the, uh, the group that took the drum and how they, it was a mistaken repatriation that went to the wrong, a group that didn't have any personal ties to the drum at all, but had a strong cultural claim in the context of cultural revitalization. Okay. And so it was, um, they had an entirely different relationship. And then in the last chapter, I talked about the drum as if the drum itself was an actor. And you know, like if you were bored, you were sitting on a shelf in a little museum and you wanted to become famous, you couldn't come up with a better scenario than this. And, uh, and how many times the drum uh, because of its presence, uh, cause people to do things. And, uh, and w in museums, w we live with these objects all the time. Um, so our museum has um, a special area, sacred storage area. And in that room, there are objects like this on, on every shelf. And uh, when I visit them, which I do fairly frequently, I talk to them all. And uh, you know, just, just 
casual, but I make sure if there are Ojibwe speakers in the museum that they come and speak to them. And uh, once a year we have a smudge uh, that is specifically for them. And in the last little while we've actually used objects that were part of our collection but are in that sacred storage area for exhibits. And the entire premise is that these are person-like things and that in order for them to be a part of an exhibit, they need to be invited the way a person needs to be invited. And their friends and relations need to be involved the way you would involve relations of another individual. And it works amazingly well because there are lots of people who, once invited, are um, happy to participate in an event which respects the personhood of these sacred or these um, ceremonial objects. And um, so uh, it, it's, um, it's a key idea. When you're talking about co-collecting, uh, what you're talking about is um, uh, a means by which the museum can become more relevant. And I happen to have a zero acquisition budget. I um, have an entire budget of, I don't know what it translates into, but 2,000 bucks. I can do practically nothing except pay my nice lady who comes to do the smudge. And um, uh, so I look at co-collecting as adding value and uh, using the digital possibilities to stabilize some of these connections so that, for instance, the digital connections that have been established through the uh, APS and the uh, library have helped Pankasi make its case in the World Heritage Site thing. Uh, they they um, have provided Pankasi with a degree of credibility. They have connected the collection to the photographs uh, so that this has become something that's very useful to the community. And from the community point of view, it's available because the community members can interrogate their family history now and they can. Uh, they can come and see these, these objects. And I'm just going to scoot through. This is the collection. It's, and this is the, this is the only time the collection has ever been on exhibit, and it was for the visit of the international uh, inspectors of the World Heritage Site. And the community said, please get it all out. So the photographs are set up in front of the objects which are in the picture. Er, and, and so um, you see here, here's the drums that belong to Naman One. And here's the rattles that the men are holding in that picture of the apprentices. This is the drum that belonged to Angus Owen that has the star on the side. And there, there was a room full of uh, women's capes and pictures of the women themselves. So this collection stepped up and said to the international assessors, these people have something exceptional. They have an incredible cultural history that is theirs to draw on. And, um, and it actually had a tremendous effect. It actually was very powerful. Um, so this is more of the collection. These are objects. Jeez. I like to, somebody else showed uh, things made out of tins. I, or was, it was the drum made out of the paint can, yeah? Okay, yeah. Anyway, it's not the only ones who do that. I, I, like, I like the elastoplast myself. This is, um, these are rattles. These are quite small rattles. And um, when Omashush came to visit the collection, he picked up this red rattle and he said, saved my life. And he told a story of how the Wikan collaborate. And he had, uh, he had had an inf infection in a tooth that was, uh, he thought was going to kill him. And, uh, and he said he died. He was, he was walking up the path to heaven that's lined with flowers, and he was walking along. And he heard a voice calling him back. And it was his grandfather. And his grandfather had used the combination of powers of this rattle and that water drum and a song to turn himself into a wolverine. And he was able to follow his grandson and pull him back. And Charlie George said, I've, I'm 73 now. I lived because of that. This is his grandmother's cape. And uh, that's a cross on there, but it also is a symbol for the highest degree of Madewa woman, and I'm quite sure she was not a Christian. It's just the capes that are in the pictures there. So. So that's the Pangasi collection. And um, so I'll just um, uh, 
so so I, uh, so as I've said, the collection stepped up to um, uh, help the Pangasi people, but the 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 uh, APS has a couple of birch bark scrolls, and Halwa recorded one of them. This is a really interesting scroll, and we used it for the World Heritage Site to explain how a people who are so removed from the world, in a, very, in a sense, could understand uh, the importance of the political act that they were undertaking, and how Ojibwe people identify their um, claims to land. So this map has, a very, it's very interesting. So it starts off with, uh, um, the, the, on the left-hand side, the great kingdom of Europe, and the bear proceeds across the ocean, and it's a map, there's the Great Lakes in Canada. It names all the lakes, and the last lake is the Great Ojibwe Lake. Um, not just the Great Lakes period, but. And then, um, and then there's a very interesting uh, moment here where it, the bear goes up the uh, uh, Rainy River, and then at this point here crosses from one watershed to another, and where he comes up, there's, it's called Sandy Lake, and there's a great burst of sand, and, um, and then that map of the little lake there is a map of Leech Lake, Ontario, which is 500 miles away from where this guy drew this map for Halliwell. And um, uh, it, it's, it's precise enough that you could drive a boat around there and not hit anything. Um, so this person who spoke no English at all on the Barents River in 1932 drew a map that included a kind of understanding of the world, including Europe and the geography of Canada and a really detailed example of a lake in the United States. And um, th these are people who understand their place in the world. And the uh, way that people make claims, and there's a nice Ojibwe word for it, for all these things, is um, they, there's two ways. Uh, there's a, to, to do an, an act which is memorable, so that you are, your story is attached to that place. And the other thing is to say, oh, this is my hunting ground, generally speaking. So it's a sort of broader claim. And um, this map shows exactly this process of doing a memorable act. In this case, it's, uh, it's done in, on behalf of a ceremony. But the bear goes around, and he, when he reaches a place where he wants the ceremony to be conducted, he rolls on the ground, and he makes the ground clean. And um, that is an act, uh, what they call an act by which the spirits make themselves known. And when people are in the bush, and they come out, you know, they've been trapping or whatever, the thing they say is this little phrase here, they're still making themselves known, the old Anishinaabe, and that's the spirits as well as the ancestors. And it's, a, it's that sense of making yourself known that is the claim that they have for the land. And um, this is a picture that Halliwell took, which illustrates this all perfectly. That's the ceremonial space for that big drum. And you see that the ground is perfectly clean. That's how that sacred space is, uh, is uh, set out, and uh, it's exactly the way the, the bear imagined it in the, uh, in the story of the, the birch bark scroll. So once again, it's an object that is actually acting on behalf of the people in the entire Pimatronaki area to reinforce their claim. So this is uh, the latest generation of people looking after the drum and visiting old people, and this is the youngest member of the Owen family who was in Philadelphia not so long ago and went to the NMAI as well. I had, a, had spent a whole day there. And, um, and actually the guy who showed us around the NMAI, um, he said to Joshua something really nice. He said, you know, we get a lot of old guys here, you know, pretty comfortable with this stuff. But the young men are afraid of it and it is very brave of you to come. And so with that, I'd like to end this uh, discussion, but um, just to reinforce the fact that it's all personal. <laughs>